Cigarette. Oh. And that goes my ashtray. What a mess. How you doing, guys? Do I see the chat? There we go. All right. We'll go in the studio in a second. Right now, I just taking a break. We wait for some people to show up. We didn't plan on doing this, but you know. If you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm just, I just destroyed my ashtray and you know, all old smelly cigarettes are on the couch right now. Oh well. Anyway, how you guys doing? Where's the chat? What's up? What's up everybody? Oh, we'll go inside in a second. Okay. Can you talk about room treatment? Acoustic panels versus foam. Foam is pretty useless. God, it's so windy. Foam is pretty useless. Um, foam will always help you somewhat um, dampen the high frequencies. And that's pretty much it. If you want any real treatment, you need... Uh, you need rock wool. I prefer rock wool to. Some people use fiberglass, but I prefer rock wool for sure. And basic treatment on a room is uh, is fairly easy, and it's not even that expensive. You know, you you treat your front wall, which is the wall in front of me right now, where your speakers are with usually you want panels that are at least four inches thick you treat the corners which is you know all your corners ideally would be one two three and four and then the corners on the sides as well and the best thing would be to use super chunks so you feel you cut the panels diagonally and you feel the entire angle um, The one thing that everybody misses in home treatments is is your back wall. So the wall that would be behind me, in front of your speakers, that's where, that is probably the most important to treat and it's the most expensive to treat and it requires a lot of real estate because the entire back wall, uh, floor to ceiling and left to right, should be a base strap, should be treated with, you know, um, rock wool at least. And it needs to be thick. It needs to be, ideally, it needs to be like six to eight inches thick. And to the other question, Nomadic Dream asks, do base traps work? Of course they do. If done properly, yeah, they do. But they can't be this thin. They need to be like this thick. So that's the basic treatment. Then if you have a small room, you want to, a small room, you want to add a little bit of a, I want to say, um, diffusion if it's like really small and you want to add a couple of clouds on top of you those can be like maybe four inches even you can get away with two but yeah and treat the first reflection points so the first reflection points would be your left speaker where you hit your left wall and your left speaker when you hit the right wall and same for the other speaker and which one is the is the perfect spot you sit on your listening position you ask a friend to run a mirror on on this wall sitting in sitting at the listening position you you see in the mirror where at what point this so windy I go inside at what point you see the speaker so Let's go back here. All right. So we were saying, uh, let me open the live stream here. 
so I can see your questions. So um, you see a little listen. So we said corners one, two, three, four, and on the top, right? And then the first reflection points, which should be where the two speakers eat each wall. So you're going to have one and two, like I have right here, right? You see on the panel. So you sit in the listening position, you have a friend putting a mirror against that wall. And you look at the mirror, you ask your friend to slide the mirror, and at some point you will see one speaker, you will see the first speaker, which is there for me, right? So you see the first speaker, that's going to be the first spot where to put the panel. The second, the second spot is where you put when you see the second speaker and so on. You do, you do it for, for both sides. And the side panels can be between two and four inches, but remember, um, the, the most important part is your corners and your, your back wall, the, the wall behind me. So that's absolutely vital because what happens um, in smaller rooms and home studios is that you, only ha you always have a null, a base null here in the listening position, right? Either you have a base null or you have too much bass. Usually it's a bass null. The reason because that happens is because the waves, the sound waves, come out from your speaker, hit the back wall, and then they come back. And they meet the wave, the waveform that come, still come from your speaker. And when they meet here, where you sit, they are these ones that come back from the wall, they are delayed, so they are out of phase. So you have a cancel here at the listening position. How you solve it, you treat the back wall. It needs to be like really, really thick and ideally should be the entire wall. So uh, what are good resources to learn more about vocal production? My courses. <laughs> Have you found a substitute for DS1 and K3 for bass sidechain compression? Why would I look for a, for a, for a substitute? There is, DS1 MK3 is the best tool. Why would you want to find a substitute? It's being used and you know it's a it's a staple on every mastering studio basically since it came out. I don't I don't understand why you want to find a substitute. There's no substitute for the DS1. Do you remember your first studio? If so, how was it? Yes, I do. Uh, well, it's two 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 different situation here the the first studio i worked at it was amazing they had a 1975 uh, neve console i think it was uh 64 channels if not more uh genelec mains on the on the on the wall uh soffit mount and then i don't know probably like three four pairs of <laughs> freaking um near field and midfield monitors my first studio it was literally a little desk at home like you know many people with um probably like a, an avid interface actually a digi design interface back then with probably a, a pre-up channel strip i remember i had a joy meek channel strip which you know the the preamps were so dark and the compressor the opto compressor was like a, a chainsaw <laughs> it was like so and it's borderline unusable but also i didn't know how to really so you know and uh, i had a good eq and from there i started adding things and adding things but my very first commercial studio so to speak yeah i remember i also have a couple of pictures uh, by that time i already have a bunch of you know outboard gear and a good monitoring system and it was a proper room it was in a is in a music was in a, in a music school my first studio I had like a mixing room, but I had access to like three, four recording uh, live room. So it wasn't bad, you know, but my first home studio was, you know, pretty shitty like everybody else. <laughs> um, I need you as my trainer for shoulder workout. Yeah, I know a lot of people <laughs> tell me that. Um, I don't, by the way, I used to train people. I used to train both bodybuilders and bikini competitors um just because you know as a passion i did that for many people dave dave david splinger hi dave i'm curious about what kind of volume levels you consider ideal for monitoring during the mastering stage uh, it's pretty much the same as for mixing you know um not 80 of the time i mix 
and master at a level, actually I mix lo at a lower level. I mix at a level where this is louder than how much I mix, you know, uh, how loud I mix. Like if I type on my keyboard, I can't hear the typing. Mastering, I usually master a little higher, like I don't, I don't know it like in, in decibel uh, because I have my monitor controller that is calibrated. I have a preset, so it doesn't matter where the knob is. I press the preset, I have two preset. One is like a little lighter than the other. But um, yeah, I, I, don't, I measured once and forgot it because I have a preset here. Um, Kefir. Uh, for 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 mastering, I tend to master slightly louder, and but still pretty low. And then once um you know towards the end, both with mixing and mastering, I just turn the volume on the mains, you know, just to crank it and make sure there's no harsh frequencies in the mid, in the high mids, and stuff like that. Favorite bands these days, uh, I want to say Parkway Drive, um, Corn Steel, you know. Uh, what else? Fuck. I, oh, Rammstein. And this is for the heavy stuff. There's a lot of new stuff in other genres that, that I that I like and I can't think of it right now. I should grab my MP3 player from, you know, my workout train and, and see it. <laughs> but I, I listen, for, for the heavy stuff, I listen to a lot of 90s and 2000s, you know, Static X, um, System of Down, the good stuff. <laughs> but Parkway Drive is one of the you know newer-ish band that I absolutely love. I I love them. How did the mastering go last night? Well, good, good, uh, good. <laughs> As always, uh, I'm finishing. I actually I'm here. I'm about to. I'm about to finish this EP for this band from Zurich, and we were actually trying to figure out uh, the genre because it's like this dark trance jungle break beat jazz <laughs> which is really cool but you know i wonder how many people ever mastered that <laughs> so i can add that to my to my credit um umatic dream what about room modes and standing waves are these always occurring rooms after treatment or does it go away so room modes and standing waves they're always present because they are it's just the physics of the room unless you have a crazy big room you know mine is pretty big but still you have them um, and they're just it's fairly easy to calculate them because they literally are based on the on the measurements on the dimensions of your room and you can calculate them and then place extra bass trap plural wherever you need with that said uh, with the treatment they go away yeah of course they go away it's it's expensive but they go away i wouldn't focus too much on trying to have a, a perfect linear room and response because a good engineer will adapt and learn how you know your monitoring system and your room sound that doesn't mean that you can have like a 60b dip or boost in the room it needs to be as linear as possible but sometimes Maybe you have like a dip that is like one and a half dB somewhere and you just can't re get rid of it. If you have two, three pairs of monitors, because of course those those deep and those dips and bumps change as you change your monitoring. Um you can you you know you know what I mean? It, there's a there's a point of diminishing return. Maybe to get that to get rid of that one little bump or that one little dip in your room, it will cost you an extra six thousand dollars and it's you know, I mean, if you're a professional, yeah, you have to do it. Like I had to do it, but otherwise you can get away as in you, you're going to be able to do good mixes, even if you don't have an absolutely perfect room, you know? So, um, that's that. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you guys. If I have a hardware example, 500 series how can i use it for mixing and mastering you okay well i have two or three videos about how to use hardware like i do in an hybrid system so i, I you know you should go watch those because it's explained you know very well and in detail uh in short 
let's say you have four compressors, right? Or two EQ and two compressors, whatever the, it is. You need as many channels on your interface, on your converter, as many analog channels you have, right? Plus two output for your monitoring system or your monitoring controller. And simple as that, you hook the input to the output, the output to the input, interface and outboard, and then you, you know, you open your hard hardware analog gear in your DAW just as, you know, uh, like a plugin, like you would do with a plugin as an hardware insert. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Noir at Blank V for the donation. I really, really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much. And um, yeah, so yeah, but watch my other videos on how to use hardware analog, you know, in a, in, in, in a hybrid system. Um, Zachary Dufresne, if you only have two quality bass traps to start, it's better to put them on the back on the wall, on the back or or corners. Uh, I would treat the corners first, but unfortunately, if you only have two, it's gonna be a problem. You know, your your room is like any other chain; it it's gonna be as strong as your weakest link. So if your front wall is not treated, you're not gonna be able to mix properly. I mean, you know, so. Hey, I hope you're doing awesome. Yes, we are. Thank you. It's treating the back with rock wool absorbers, a viable option for removing best base nulls. Yes, absolutely. That's what I use. That's what most people use. Most studio, most studios actually have the back wall, which is basically has another wall in front of, and it's made of rock wool. It needs to be thick. To stop base, base frequency, you need thickness. You need mass. So if you do it like this thing, it ain't going to do shit. Uh, do I need a patch bay, a console, or a few outputs on the interface? Depends how many how many hardware unit you have. If you have, let's say, eight channels of analog, you need. Sorry, if you have six channels on of analog, you you and you have a eight channel interface, you're good. If you wanna change the path and the routing and the signal path, like you want EQ first, a compressor later, or other way around, you need a patch bay, or the flock like I have. If you have 60 channels of analog like I do, that's going to be a problem because <laughs> you need an extended system. Uh, you know, like I have, like I have uh, three AVB interfaces, CAT5 plus the DDA converters for mastering dedicated. I have two lines. I have the flock 32 channels. So it depends how many, how many uh, piece of hardware you have. Um, small desk is a bliss I, I don't know I like my big desk <laughs> does a does a mohawk really help with stereo image yeah absolutely I mean I want to say like probably 50 percent of how good the master sounds it depends on your mohawk you know it's just it's a proven fact scientific you know and I mean Ask Tom Lord Algy, you know, we both have a Mohawk. His is smaller than mine, but you know, it's, you know, it's, it's probably one of the must have for mastery, the Mohawk, you know, before, before monitoring, I want to say before the converters for sure. Um, thank you for your help. It really helped me a lot. No problem. Do you have experience with ear fatigue after a long mastering session? No, I, I don't. I, I really don't. I actually did a video not long ago in, you know, how, how high can I hear it still, you know, it was like around 18K. The, the, the key is to monitor a lower level, use headphones at the least possible, doesn't matter high or low, you know, it's, it's just the proximity of the, the, the little speaker in the, the little driver in the headphones close to your, to your eardrum that is damaging over time. So try not to use headphones. Which makes me laugh, right? <laughs> I was lucky enough to see Rammstein in Toronto. I was out of this world. Yeah, Rammstein, I had tickets for Los Angeles, but they canceled. Fuck that. So, yeah, when they come back. Do you have a, did you have a chance to AB SSL Fusion and Telegular Cream? Yes, of course, I had both. They are, I don't even know what, how you can compare the two. 
the SSL cream is an SSL compressor based on SSLG with a Pultec EQ, only the boost part. The Fusion doesn't have compression. So how do you compare them? You could very well put the cream in insert in the Fusion. It would be a, a good, you know, a good match. But they are nothing to they're nothing alike. One is a saturator, you know, HF compressor, stereo imaging and coloring and transformer. The other one is a SSL compressor with a pull tech boost section EQ. You can even compare the violet EQ to the to the cream. The cream is like literally like a very broad, uh smooth and yet yeah, powerful, very musical boost EQ, pull tech style. The violet is classic SSL. So it's a more punchy. I like the top end of the fusion. I don't like really the low end. It's a little too boomy. But yeah, but you can't really compare. There are not two units that you can compare. You know, you could compare, I don't know, the Degler Cream to the NG or another SSL style, style compressor. But the SSL fusion doesn't have compression at all. Uh, all right, all right. Ooh. Oh, why this was... Hit the no show. Someone said you fucking rock, Dave. Of course, we'll. <laughs> YouTube saw that like as an offensive thing. No. Um, again, thank you for the donation. You guys are awesome. Oh my god, so many questions. I'm trying to go. If you want your questions to like, you know, be on top, there's a super chat. We appreciate the support, and I get your question first. Do you have? Okay, I was lucky enough. Uh, did you have? In your opinion, are Apollo 16 or uh, 16X converters good enough grade for clipping for mastering? Um, to be honest, no. To be honest, no. Then I'll leave it at that. I don't think we will gain anything by clipping those converters as opposed to use a high quality clipper in your DAW. Those are not the com converters you want to clip. I learned a bit. Uh, I've learned a bit much from watching your content by the far best content creator on mix on mixing that I've watched. Thank you, JD Tracks. Uh, circuit. Uh, this may be an, a typical question for you, but while you normally discuss mixing and mastering, I'm curious whether you compose or write original music for artists aside. Uh, wonderful Bella. Thank you, first of all. Um, yes and no on occasion. I don't promote that, but there are a handful of artists with which I work like directly and I, I do arrangement for them. I, I write parts, yes, but um, I'm not selling myself as a writer, you know. I do it, I can do it, I've, di I've done it, I was a musician. I don't, I don't do it like, <clears throat> it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not an open service. There are some some artists, for example, soon I'm gonna start working with a with a gothic band from Netherlands. They're awesome, and uh, we will do something like that. I did some some of these some of the stuff were with, uh, for example, Ty uh, Oliver from uh, Power Man Five Thousand for his project, and yeah, but not usually. Um, hey Amir, how what's up, man? Good to see you. Good to see you. Do you think the precise, powerful sound of studio monitors can lead to weak master? No, 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 no. The, the whole I mix in shitty monitors because that's the real world reference. It, it doesn't work. It's a, it's a really, really faulty way of thinking, you know, because um, your studio monitors, if they're good monitors they are a critical listening they're not necessarily a pleasant listening that's why i don't like you know monitors that make things sound too pretty you know good monitors are a critical listening they are they tell you more than you know a more forgiving consumer system so if anything this is what like people don't understand like a lot of people mix in their studio and they say oh my mix sounds great in studio and then I go in the car or I listen to like whatever other media and it sounds like shit well that can be a few things it can be you're not a good mixer yet it could be your room is shit or your monitoring are too pretty which is very often the case with monitor because companies want you to buy their monitors 
so they tend to like sometimes make models that um when you first compare to the others they sound a little better the first five seconds till they get you they get the first impression from you and um but that's not good if anything when you are when you get to a certain level when i, I don't want to i want to sound cocky but you know it, it, when i mix here and then i listen to my mix in in like i don't know my phone or car or whatever it sounds better it, that's how it's supposed to be because good monitors will help you understand how to make your mix translate everywhere so uh, can you check really quick on a shitty monitor just because yeah that's why i have the gbl you know they're like limited bandwidth so you focus on the mid-range for example these ones tell you like if you have like a um, too much of the woolly range but you don't mix on these you know otherwise everything else or the way you fix that problem and everything else is going to be a mess um my question i'm currently looking to get a hardware fat so what do you think of the ubk fat so versus the original why is it more expensive i don't know why is it more expensive um well actually i know why because basically he has to buy the fat so from empirical labs and then modify it so that's why it's more expensive. Um, I have two fatsos and I have the original. So that's your answer right there, <laughs> which one I prefer. Um, I don't, I don't, I think the fatso, it's perfect as is. Granted that I have the controller. And I think Dave Dare is a genius. Dave Dare, if you guys don't know, is the guy, the you know CEO of Empirical Lab, the guy who invented the distressor and the fatso. He's a genius and I think it's very, very hard to top his genius. He made the unit this way for a reason and I think it's very hard to be topped. The UBK is different. Um, maybe he's at the same level. I mean, at the end of the day, is a fat so, but I, I don't prefer it to the original. The original is the classic, is, uh, is what made the fat so amazing, so no. I would get the normal, I would get the regular one. By the way, if you're interested to get a fatso, get in line because they are back order. And I'm actually talking to Dave there right now, like by email. Hi Dave, if you're watching. And uh, they're back order because everybody wants to buy one, apparently, <laughs> probably, thanks to me too. But I'm trying to get one for, for my um, business partner because he wants one, because he saw mine and uh, you know, get in line because they're they're like out of uh on back order um do you have you ever used ipad in your productions no how often do you use the fusion 99 percent of the time um do you think if monitors are so powerful am I, oh that was better i think i answered that question thin voices do you slam a compressor or limiter first to feed the chain thin voices i'll probably fix the eq first and try to give him some some body um if you really have a shitty recording because whoever recorded recorded with a bad microphone or cut the low end you know up to 120 and you don't have information there, you can kind of recreate it with uh, sub generators or psychoacoustic processors like Max Bass. It works pretty well. So you need to fix the EQ and you need to find a way to, to, to give it some body. Sometimes some slow and saturation work and, you know, but first fix the tone and then you fix the dynamic, you know, as for slam a compressor or limit, I don't slam anything. Um, if, if this voice is, this, the voice is, I, I show how I use limiters on vocals. You know, sometimes you get this recording, vocal recording where the, the singer is just maybe not that experienced. They don't know the recording engineer doesn't know how to position the mic because everybody like put the mic in front and sing. It ain't that, it ain't that easy. Uh, thank you so much for the donation. Snow, Dan Bleak. I hope I didn't butcher your name. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, uh, 
sometimes you receive vocals that have like spikes here and there and it's just it's just the limiter is the tool to use it's not even it's better or it's faster is the tool to use before hitting a compressor otherwise the compressor you would be limited or on where you can set the threshold because you will react to those spikes too much so and a, and a limiter if used conservatively is fairly transparent uh, but first fix the tone do you know what eric valentine uses for bass trapping it was some german company but could i never find i don't i don't um i don't know what eric used for barefoot i work at barefoot studio in his studio we you know we hang out a couple of times um i just remember they had this tube traps in the control room and you can see them in in my videos and in my course with the metal course which i filmed at barefoot studio um to be honest i i i feel the material for the most part was rock wool from what i could see and they were probably they had some kind of tuning because i think they had a tube inside but i don't know the company i don't know the company but i remember for the most part they were like tube shaped in all rooms if i don't remember wrong definitely in the main room where i was um robert miller um and again snow dean bleep thank you thank you so much for for the donation oh that question <laughs> sorry man did you check out the the key three speakers yet it's like the tesla of speakers conversion and monitor controller all in one with cardioid bass i i just order with uh west we, ria and concerned about heat okay so i didn't i didn't i didn't try the key three i know they are fairly popular right now in mastering a lot of mastering engineers use them and seem pleased with them um i'm not a big fan of software uh control for speakers but the last time i tried was a long ago so you know it most likely it things are changed. I know Bob Katz talked about the, the key three. Um, unfortunately, I don't have experience with them. Um, I can tell you that I know at least three master engineers that I respect and they are very happy with them. So I am, you know, it's it's probably safe to say they're, they are amazing monitors. Um, I'm very happy with my Eve. I honestly don't feel like, you know, the need of scouting for other monitors those the eaves are insane as for the ria don't be worried about the heat it doesn't get that hot you know for example my uh, my ssl fusion is definitely you know the hottest of the units here and i have the empress which is you know four tubes i have the ria and i have other th other things but the fusion is definitely the one that gets hotter i left a little bit of space on on top of see so you can see there on top of the 500 rack but you it doesn't get that hot you know so don't worry about it if you can leave you know uh, a unit free on on the on top of it but with the 500 series you really can't because you have the the rack you know but don't worry about it it doesn't get so hot um let's keep going with questions where are we where are we where are we oh my god so many for those apollo 16 converters good enough great for clipping and mastering i already responded that um for those of us limited to working only in the box what are some mastering grade plugins that you can recommend anything from plugin alliance worth it no uh, the only thing that i can think of plugin alliance would be the alpha compressor and that's it <laughs> the mag eq is a good plugin but it does it doesn't even you know it, it doesn't touch the hardware no for for mastering grade soft tube the whole vice bundle um split eq from eventide um if you want color i would say definitely the sonox inflator the pulsar modular p42 my new absolute favorite 
for color and mastering. Now that it has all the new updates and stuff, I will make a video on it soon. But um, in the box, in the box mastering, you need the vase bundle. That's that's first. And then if you want a bunch of colors, you know, I have like several videos on what are my favorite saturators. Um, but yeah, you know, plugin plugin alliance, just a just a uh, alpha compressor, but it's a transparent compressor. When you have the DS1 MK3, you don't need that. Perfect. Thanks for the answer. Um, do your monitors have any isolation from the stand floor? Also, should subwoofer be isolated from the floors? Well, you can. So, yeah, my monitors have isolation from the stands, but it it, it unless you unless you measure your room, like this is in regard of the subwoofer. Yes, sub subwoofer. It's better if it's decoupled from the floor, but it don't expect like night and day difference. And in any case two inches when you position your woofer in your room two inches left and right or two inches or one inch you know wrong position it makes a whole it makes so much more difference than just the coupling or not the coupling the coupling is not hard you know but the positioning is a lot trickier with the subwoofer i just went to a friend of mine studio and we were listening to throat and i was like as soon as he put the song Oh, and I was like, dude, you have a massive fucking null here. And so I showed him how to better his situation by, you know, placing the sub on the on the chair right here where I sit now. And then start walking around the room. And then at some point you will hear a spot where the base is, you know, solid. And that's where you place your sub. That's just one move to do. But um, yeah. It's not night and day, the coupling. How long can you mix and master before you take a break? It depends on the genre. I can go on for... I mean, for mastering, it's different what I can do and what it's the best. That I think it's the best. For mastering, I don't like to do long sessions because mastering is such a... You know, it, it, it's a job of, of detail and... You know, you kind of lose the edge fairly soon if you like master for like four or five hours or something. Um, I can do it. That's probably my max, like four or five hours. I can mix for longer. And usually I take a break every two hours, like a sick break or a coffee break, not long. And then, uh, but yeah, I, I, in mastering, I just don't like If I have deadlines and I have a lot of work, I can do it. I can do it well, but... I prefer not to do long mastering sessions because of that, because like the top end, you start losing it, you know, and um, while mixing, I, I have a little more tolerance, but yeah. What listening level DB you recommend to mix and mastering? I don't, I don't remember how many DB, like I said, I have a preset on my, um, on my monitor controller, SPL Mercury mastering DAC. I never tried it. I have the dangerous. I have a dangerous AD plus and a DA for the DA. Um, would you get into making plugins? Uh, we are actually, we are actually. We are with a company. We are working on my first plugin and there will be more to come. And they're going to be awesome. But, you know, I wanted to wait to be with the right people to do that. And uh, they, they would give me like freedom of actually do the plugins the way, you know, I want it because I just don't want to compromise or I don't want to rush it, you know, but yeah, we are. What do you think about Yamaha NS10s? I never clicked with them. I'm not a fan of it. <laughs> and that shows you, that goes to show you that monitors are a very, very personal choice. Many engineers that I like, namely Andy Wallace uses NS10s and I just can't. I had them in my first studio. I had them in several studios I worked. And I actually, at one point, I had um, the NS40s, which are the three ways of NS10. So two white cones and a Twitter. Very rare. I had them in my studio in Europe because a, a, a producer friend of mine dropped them there. And uh, they were horrible. <laughs> but, uh, you know, 
um, like I said, many, many engineers use it. And um, I just, I just, you know, probably because they know them, they, they've been using them for so long. I personally very much dislike them. Uh, Noir et Blanc V, thank you again for the donation, your question. Again, guys, if you want your question on top, use the super chat. Um, Hey David, on the 1978, wondering if you use the character section much. Also, is it out of your rack currently? Yeah, okay, so yes, I actually use the character on the 1978 pretty often and very successful. Is a, I think I, I mentioned this before, is a, a really unique kind of saturation. And I actually, yes, is out of my rack and I miss it right now, but I'll explain why. Um, like the first time that I, it was like a ha ha moment with that. It was when I had a, a pair of like a rhythmic guitars for metal, metal rock guitars. And I just run it through it and it just softened and got rid of all the harshness and top end. And I don't remember if they were plug-in amps or real amps. I remember that was a ha ha moment in, in which I felt like I found, oh wow, this is perfect for this. So it's a kind of saturation that really smooth on the top end and make things darker in a pleasant way. And so that's how I think of that character knob. Uh, it's not a super aggressive distortion, you know, but I wouldn't go past probably 12 o'clock with it, given the regular level going in, but I really like it. Um, I don't have the 1978 uh, right now in my racks because I got no more space. And I'm not joking. You saw me taking the 1970 out from here to put the Empress. This rack is getting like taller by the day and you don't see it, but I have another rack here. I have another rack here. And the reason is I got another what, uh, 12, 14 units here next to me. The problem is they are already taken. Right now there's no gear in there because I'm waiting new hardware that is coming and one of these pieces is six units so <laughs> more than half of this rack is already taken and there is a point in which too much gear becomes a distraction and it's not helping you anymore and i feel like i'm there right i i I'll, i'm gonna get this new unit which was supposed to be here in november that's been you know delays because it's custom made i'm gonna put it there and then another one and then at that, at that point, I, I, you know, I feel like if I have more, it becomes a distraction instead of helping me mixing. So that's why I don't have it at the moment. Um, let's keep going. Do you have a favorite type of rock wool safe and sound propellants? No, um, no. The one that you buy at like uh, Home Depot, they have the rock wool. What type of speakers are the ones on your corner? Eve Audio SC3012 the main models for EVE Audio, the biggest um, mains. Thank you Snowden Bleep for the donation and your question. What's your workout routine? Uh, do def defined traps help me see 808 sub bass? Uh, yes, they do. Just like the Mohawk help, the Mohawk helps with, you know, mastering and stereo image. That's a fact, all right? Um, traps do, help mixing 808 that's why you know everybody asked me like what was you know on uh on bella's throat for the base for the big 808 that's 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 it that's you know if you don't have traps you can't mix low end that well but no <laughs> jokes aside my workout routine is pretty simple and it, it became simple after two decades of complexity <laughs> when you realize that you don't need 15 angles to you know hit your shoulders or 25 angles to eat your glutes or your quads. Uh, my routine is a, is a, is a push-pull legs, basically. So one day I pull, which is back workout, which could be heavy rows, deadlift, and all the accessory for your, for the accessories for your back. One day is push, so it can be a bench press, it could be a dumbbell press, it could be a hover up press, and then all the accessories for, for your chest and your front, and then one leg day. With all the which is squat and then all the accessory for your legs and the next is another push um which is if i pressed i will overhead press if i press the previous day 
And in all this, all the accessories for me are what my um, weak points are. So for example, I throw legs pretty much every other workout, like at the end, you know, a couple of exercises, light, and then arms as well, because my arms are shitty. And that's pretty much it. And the only thing that matters is progression. Don't, don't focus on numbers like, oh, three sets of this or four sets of that. The, it doesn't matter if you do three sets of 10 or four sets of 12. What matters is you do 10 pounds today and you do 11 tomorrow and you do 13 the next day and 14 the next day and, and so on. And then you go back like this, right? So 12 reps with 10. When, you, when you're done, you do 10 reps with 12 and then you go up again. That's the one thing that is, and focus on the main lift. So deadlift, squat, and, you know, and, and one press. Um, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> What type of speakers? Okay, why did you choose them? Because they're the best out there. I am late to the party, so I don't know if anyone asked this. Did you produce Bella Kelly or maybe just mix and master, just promote her? We are, whoa, well, you're not following. I did, I do everything for Bella. I do everything for Bella. Of course, I, no, I don't, I, don't, I didn't just mix and master. I, I'm, I'm the creative director for the project. So I record her, I arrange her vocals, I, pick the songs, I arrange everything, I record, I mix and master, and then the whole visual concept is me. And then of course I have a team that helped me realize it, but everything about Bella, it's, it's me. Um, would you get into making plugins? We already responded that. Uh, let's say your room is shit. Could you use a program like DRVR monitor to help with this problem? You want the truth? No, no. Just use headphones if your room is absolutely awful and try to correct them the best that you can, even though up until a few years ago, there were no correction softwares for the headphones and people were using them anyway. But it doesn't matter how shitty your, your room is having a pair of speakers is mandatory you know of course you're not gonna produce like top 10 mixes and you will have to do a lot of trips to the car and a lot of trips on other you know media and everything and use the headphones probably 50 percent but a pair of speakers doesn't matter what pair even these ones that are 90 dollars you have to have it doesn't matter like how many how shitty your your room is Compressors on vocals or just reg multiband compressor on vocals or, or regular compressor? No, a multiband compressor on vocals is a viable tool. Sometimes some singers have um, a couple of ranges. They have a pretty balanced performance overall, but they have a couple of ranges that just here and there are unpredictable. They come up like when you when they hit some notes, the 200 comes out or, or the 1K on female vocals is a viable tool. I prefer dynamic EQs on vocals just because it's more natural, but um, is a viable tool, you know? You can, and usually you want to do that. If you have to use a multi-band compressor and a dynamic EQ, you want it to do, you want it on a vocal, you want to do it like pretty early in the chain. And then maybe once you fixed and like smooth out those ranges that are wild, you can touch it with a regular, which is wide band compressor after. You can use both. How often do you use your spacecraft on the moon nowadays? You couldn't take it. You you you, you couldn't take it away from me. <laughs> uh, you're cooling to toying with the idea of getting one. Good luck with that because they're sold out and they're sold out the next batch and the next one. <laughs> but I use it all the time in mastering. I use it probably seventy percent of the time. Um, LKV, thank you for the donation. And uh, your question, tips on getting, setting crossover points on a multiband for vocal and, or mastering, what do you aim for when setting this up? That is a great question. That is an absolutely great question. And it's unfortunately hard to answer because of course the answer, I don't want to be that guy, but of course the answer is it depends, but I'm going to try to narrow down the concept. Okay. Let's, let's say you have a, Let's say you have a three band, right? Or four band compressor. Um, generally speaking, this is not a rule and it's just a general idea. The higher, the higher bands, 
higher in frequencies, they tend to need a faster attack and a faster release, all right? Because when you try to control the top end, it's usually fast events. S's, hats, snares, fast events, right? The lower you go in frequency, the, the longer and the slower the, the audio events are. So you have the guitars, let's say, in the middle of the synths, and then you have the bass, and then you have the kick, or the other way around, you have the kick and then the AOA, right? So as you go, as you move towards the lower frequencies and the lower bands of your multiband compressor, you want to have a slower attack and a slower-ish release. The slower attack is kind of necessary because think about a waveform for an 808, right? So a hi-hat is going to be like this. An 808 is going to be like this, right? So not only you don't need a fast attack for the low end, usually again not a rule but if you set up too fast of an attack on a on a slow event like an 808 or a kick drum especially plug-in compressors multiband they will start to stutter they will go in and out that slow event right they'll go in and out so fast they will cause stut what we call stuttering they will just do brrr, like this same you can hear it with a gate when you set a gate and you set an attack and a release too fast on a kick drum for example or on a bass you will hear a stutter you know it's like a an auto gate but it sounds like shit. so this is the general rule the higher bands are usually want more uh, faster attack and a faster release than, than the low range as for the crossover points as you asked that's tricky that's tricky because Let's say you're on a vocal, I can tell you like the usual, right? And again, it's not a rule, but you want to control all the hard consonant and S's. So, right? All those, all those sounds in the top band. So imagine the top end as a de uh, So very quick attack and release and that, it depends on the singer, but let's say you can have, you can usually have two scenarios, 9K, and up, so very, very top end. Some microphones are really sharp like there, all right? Or even in mastering, there's some some songs that have like that, someone that cranked the Maggie Q too much yeah, and you need to fix it. So 9K and up or 8.5 and up. So to catch that they're really, sometimes even 10 or 12, so just that top end. Uh, on vocals, it can be like lower. Like for example, I wanna say, let's say 6K because the 6K is the rat, the frequency that scratches. So you can try to set it like that to control not just the super high top end, but all those hard consonants that I was talking about. And then you have the mid range. Let's, let's narrow it down to three bands. Otherwise it becomes a mess. I know. Um, so you have the mid range. So your vocals, like the tone of the song or the vocal. In that case, again, if you have this one around 6K or 5K, that's where you start your mid band and depending on the low end that's the tricky part you're going to set the last one which is going to be maybe around 110 or 120 and again if you have a four band then you want to control the let's say 50 and below but it 50 and below and at that point the low mid band will go from 50 and 20 and 120 but again um you need to consider two things one for the low end, where is the kick drum? Where is the bass? And which one is more prominent? And you go either below or above the fundamental frequency when you set the crossover, right? And the other thing to consider is if you don't use a linear phase multiband compressor, the crossover point will cause a little bit of phase shift and a little bit of null. Some engineers, like I do it, some you know experienced engineers do it. You set that core that let's say it's usually 250, 200 around that range. You set your low crossover in a spot where you would cut with an EQ. So you kind of take two birds with one stone, you know. If you have a little too much 250 or too much 220, you set the, the crossover there, and sometimes it actually helps to have a little bit of new hair, you know? This is just general rules like that.
Uh, all right, all right. I hope that answered the question. Let's see. We are, we are behind with the questions. So, uh, do you use Voice of God by UAD? And it's not what do you use to replace it? Well, I use it. Um, I don't use the the UAD because there's a free version that is called Barcode Dog from Bob Lads, uh, Bod's Lab. And no, it's not a joke. It's called Barcode Dog, and it's free and it's exactly the same. And I actually put it in my free plugins video, I think, because it's amazing. Um, that's what I use. It's free. How important is volume ducking sidechain for making headroom in a mix? In a in a in a dense mix, very important. I sidechain a lot of things. People sidechain just kick and bass. I sidechain everything. I sidechain all my effects. I sidechain whatever is in the mid range, so guitar, synths, whatever with the lead vocal, I sidechain background vocals with something else. I sidechain the snare room to whatever. I sidechain everything. Uh, it's very important. Do you project introducing ambisonic binaural mixes into your toolbox mix between within the next five years? Uh, I ask as I'm often surrounded by more by hip hop pop, but I'm curious about your market genres. Well, granted that I mix everything and everything in the mid in the middle. Um, I'm probably you're asking about um, Atmos. Yeah, unfortunately, I will have to have Atmos. I'm not. A fan right now it's a bit messy with the all different encoding and decoding and it's kind of a period of uh, experimentation because it's a new technology is an is new everything um, there are already systems that digitally optimize the system the phase between the speakers because it's a, an absolute mess I I want to see more before I actually move to Atmos when I do, if I do, you know, I will call Eve and we'll set it up. But uh, for now, I'm not looking forward to it, to be honest, because it's a, it's a bit of a nightmare right now. And um, I have a few friends that, you know, put the, the Atmos in. Um, it's a market. It is it, it's definitely a market. Will it replace stereo? No. But is it here to stay for a while? Absolutely, because... Uh, Dolby, Apple, Tesla, they all invested money in it. And when these guys invest money, they will shove it into people's throat no matter what, because they ain't gonna lose money, no matter what. So, Polk Fingers, it is, is it normal that Melody have higher peaking level than kick and drum in dance music? Uh, I don't know if it's normal. Usually kick is the highest in EDM music and dance music. Uh, snare not that much peak level at least so the melody can have yeah I mean I think of like very like hard leads on EDM or Psytrance or, or dubstep they can have a higher peak than kick than kick but it's usually not normal I mean they can they're usually side chained too on EDM music, so if anything, they should be probably at the same level. But yeah, it, it, it's not, it's, it's not a sin. Let's put it this way: if you have your your melody uh, peaking higher than your kick, it's a bit weird. Yeah, it's a bit weird because usually the kick drum has more energy and has a fast transient and a snappy transient that results in a higher peak level. So, Dan Brook. Uh, would you recommend the Wes NG Bus Compressor or Rupert Neep Portico 2 as first outboard gear? What's your listening working volume for mixing and mastering? I talked about my, mis my uh, mixing and mastering volume is very, very, very low, like typing on the keyboard kind of low, and then I crank it like towards the end. But as for the West NG, well, of course, if I have it, it's because I prefer it. Uh, with that said, the NG Portico is a good all-in-one unit, if you are not planning on adding anything else because like the example that i that i gave when people were asking me why the fusion instead of the portico because the fusion doesn't have a compressor 
So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven compressors that I can put an insert in it. With the Portico, yeah, I have another compressor, which is not really a dedicated compressor for mastering or mixing. It's kind of an all-in-one. So it's like, it's good at everything, but not great at anything, you know? So I, I just don't, I'm not a fan of things like that. I'm a, I'm a, but also I have, I'm blessed with, you know, having all the stuff. If you have only the budget for that unit for the next five years, you know, or maybe that one and an EQ only, and that's going to be your setup because you don't care about having like a, you know, a, a thousand piece hardware or you're not doing it for a living. So the investment doesn't make sense for you is a good unit. But consider those things. Consider expandability. Consider that the compressor is somewhat limited compared to a dedicated compressor. And if you if we look at the compressor alone from for between the Rupert Portico and the NG, the NG of course shits on it. But it's kind of normal. Because this is a mastering EQ as precise as it gets with digital recall, with you know, all more parameters that you can possibly ask for. And it's a dedicated compressor. It only does that, you know, the other is a whole bunch of things. All right, all right. Um, Robert Miller, thank you for the donation. Much appreciated. And here's your question. Hi, David, I'm trying to get better definition while recording my metal kick drum kinking thinking to isolate the kick with a platform thoughts the platform helps um granted that is isolated and make sure that doesn't have any weird resonance sometimes people like lift it and they leave it empty right but if you are trying to get better definition granted that i'm assuming let's go through the usual right so you have a beater you have an inside kick and you have an outside kick if you lack definition, I want to say, without going into, you know, what shells and everything, um, I want to say I, I would look first at phase, right? And I'm assuming you already know this. So, but I'm not but saying it anyway. Because lack of definition, the first thing that I think of is like maybe the three mics are not like perfectly in phase or it can be improved. I really am a fan of putting uh, really the um, blankets over the kick. And especially, you know, if you have an, out, an outside mic, you know, put the blanket on top of the on top of the stand and then roll it around the kick. That helps isolate your kick. It's better for when you go compressing it. It's better for when you, when you need to clean it up. It's better for just everything because the outside mic is usually a condenser that might not have a great rejections from the side. So you get you, you pick up a lot of shit, that really helps. The platform helps as long as you know is filled in, and yeah, if you haven't already, like make sure those three mics are in phase. And like I said before in my infamous HPF video, when you when you place the mics and you have them in phase, don't go EQ each one individually. You know, bust them together in one channel and EQ and compress that one channel with all the three mics together. And if needed, once you place them, of course, they're not going to have perfect phase because there are three different spots, right, from the beater. So it's perfectly okay to, before anything else, to align those three mics, you know, kick in, kick out, uh, beater, kick in and kick out, and then bust them and then process them together. It's not okay for me to align other things like overheads and room mics because that's you lose all the 3D. But for kicks, I would I would say these are the main advice. And then if you're still not happy, then let's look at your microphones. You know, especially for the beater, if you want more definition, if you want more focus low end, again I would at that point look at the outside mic. Maybe you're using a condenser when you could very well be using a dynamic instead which will give you more focus and then add maybe a sub kick to add a little more hump if you miss something from the outside from the outside mic i hope this answered the question and thank you again for the donation again if you guys want your question to be answered first just use the super chat okay and you also support me 
what would your signal flow be on the two bus if you had fusion and G bus comp comp before fusion or in the insert in the insert no doubt um, same if you have the 1973 the compressor it goes into into the insert even because I don't know if you have the fusion but if you have the fusion you know that when you press the insert um, first of all you have the possibility to use anything that is an insert in mid side so if you have an SSLG comp or well G comp doesn't really make much of a difference because you have one set of controls but if you have a compressor which has you know stereo and dual dual controls you can use it in mid side same for DQs and also you can change the sequence of the EQ where where to place the EQ and other things in the fusion so definitely an insert Martin Canavo hi David is there a very fairly cheap set of monitors that you have worked with that you would recommend I would recommend Eve and let me explain you why not just because I have like the huge monitors but because if you noticed Eve is the only one or one of the few companies that they don't have five different lines right so the superstar line the pro line the middle of the row line the cheap line the super cheap line they have one line they go from mine to the smallest that's it and they have the same technology across the board that means I know if I mix with you know the six inches they have the same port on the back that I love about these they have the same tweeter that I love about these even if mine is the size of a small baby this technology is the same you know the materials are the same the response are the same so I'm super confident to tell people like get even even the smallest model models because yes of course you're not going to have the freaking wall shaking low end that I have you can add a sub but the accuracy and the technology that I love that's why I picked these monitors for a bunch of reasons I actually have to film a clip for Evo Audio I'm talking about the SC3012 soon um how amazing the Twitter is compared to other companies that have the same kind of technology but it's not because those tweeters are laser beam and if you move your head one like five inches you don't hear anything while Eve I can move across my board and going from you know outboard to outboard and the sweet spot is huge that's one of the things so this is this is what I would recommend recommend Eve just get the bigger model you can you know afford and you're good to go I'm a really big fan of the new uh 3040 I think they're called they're smaller than mine but they have like one big woofer here and then the Twitter and mid-range here there are, those are really compact and but amazing monitors people don't understand how big they are these ones like you guys can't tell from the video because they are like a mile deep and like 120 pounds those are compact but they they punch like really hard hard um Rudol Jube I, I can't even try to pronounce your name sorry how do you solve delay comp in Pro Tools for accurate side chain why you guys have problems with Pro Tools and hardware there's no problem in Pro Tools with hardware and delay compensation I made two videos showing how to set up to set that up there's absolutely especially new Pro Tools has even compensation for the oxes I don't understand why people have the problems please watch my videos on how to set delay compensation for hardware there's no problems in Pro Tools with uh, with delay compensation I mean I use 52 channels of analog on mixes <laughs> if I had a problem with delay compensation I couldn't I couldn't do it I wouldn't be able to do it I don't understand I really generally don't understand why people have this problem I I think I suppose is probably some company that makes the hardware like I know almost for a fact that Apollo has some inherent problem with Pro Tools and hardware I think probably because both companies wants to sell their hardware uh, and you know Apollo and UA wants to sell Luna I don't know if it's on purpose but other like my system I have zero problems 
like zero problems with delay compensation once you follow my instruction on how to set hardware delay compensation and latency, which is a one-time thing. You set it once and you forget about it. Do you mix master orchestral music? If not, this is a thing you would like to try out if you had a chance to work with a real orchestra. I am yes and no, as, as in I mixed real orchestras. MC Solar album, Geopolitik, uh, the orchestras that you hear are real. They were recorded in, uh, I want to say Vienna. Uh, we were in Paris, so I know they didn't use the Paris orchestra. They used, the I think, the Vienna or or Bucharest, somewhere like that. Alana Chart uh, booked the full orchestra. So I mixed the orchestra, but it was in a context of what we can call it, like a hip-hop album you know um for mc solar i also mixed a lot of uh several uh video games soundtracks where there were orchestras i didn't i don't know if we, they were um fake or not i suppose they were like VS, vst but they sounded real and i can do it i mean i'm not like i don't produce orchestral music like every day but it happened. Uh, I like it. I know how to do it. I don't have any problems with, you know, orchestras. Um, yeah, it's, you know, if I have the chance to mix more, I will mix more because, yeah, I like it, actually. Dag Torgerberstein. Wow, I'm so sorry. Thank you for the donation. Much, much appreciated. I'm so sorry. I'm much, I can't even start to pronounce your name. Like, Dag. I'll call you Dag. Thank you so much for that for the donation. You guys really appreciate it. Um, I love to spend times with you in live when I can. And, uh, you know, this helps for sure. Uh, when adding saturation to sub bass 808, should it be done in parallel to keep the bottom of the low end or unaffected? Then add saturation to the mid range on separate channel. It can be both ways. Sometimes, sometimes you can add uh, saturation on the actual insert without going parallel if it's just a little bit and it's subtle. For example, I do it with my uh, drummer saturator that's great on synth and low, you know, synth bass like that. Um, it depends what you want. Like saturation on the sub, it's tricky because a little goes a long way and it's very, very easy to fuck up, you know, but especially if you use analog, it's, it's good, you know, it can be done. I want to say it's almost like two, two different ways to approach it, but analog saturation on 808 is not perceptible. It doesn't sound like distortion. It just sounds like, wow, the low end just got bigger. That's, you know, still conservative. That's what I do with my, you know, multiband saturator right there. And um, many times I don't need, I don't feel the need to go parallel for that. For the mid range, yes, it's more common just because you want to bark and then you want a fader to automate that during the song or just, you know, increase it, the amount. Um, by the way, if you're wondering, it's I just retouched what this tattoo yesterday. So I have the film on it and I retouched this one. <laughs> That's why I'm touching my hand so much. Um, all right. What workhorse microphone would you recommend for recording vocals? If you want a um, condenser, Austrian Audio AC808 or... Roosevelt Mini K87, and if you want a, con a, a dynamic, definitely SM7. Mm, let's see. Thank you for your opinion. If you can get only one mastering compressor, what would you choose? And G Bus as first analog gear, would you take it as first analog EQ or compressor? Okay, well, first mastering compressor, what you would choose? Uh, that's, a, that's a hard question. There are so many, you know, uh, like the thing is, like I have so many different compressors um, for mastering and two more to come. But I want to say if you, if you want a mastering compressor, not a mix bus, not a two bus, not a, not a compressor that you can do both, like the NG, it's strictly a mastering compressor and a versatile one. I want to say I would probably look into the Crane Song or the Alpha from Elysia. Those are two compressors that 
will handle pretty much anything you throw at him in a mastering situation. Um, you will miss tube. In my case, I'm using right now the Rhea, but I have another Varium you come in. You, maybe you want to add one of those, but those two compressors or the NG bus, that's a viable option for sure. As a first analog gear, I would probably take a compressor, not an EQ. Um, all right, all right. Audio Paladin. Hi, David. Is there anything out there that compares to R&D 542s and what it does to your top-down tuba mixing chain? Fatso, maybe? Nope. Nope. Nothing. <laughs> Period. There's nothing to add. Nothing. They can be replicated. It's, what they do is, you know, they only the, the 542s do that. Um, thank you so much, David. Love what you do for the community. Thank you, Martin Cannavo. Uh, true fall fallacy. Avid hardware is designed for Pro Tools to know what the inherent round trip delay of the interface unit will be, and we'll automatically compensate for that. Uh, that the hardware delay is not an issue. The hardware delay is not an issue with everything unless the company that makes a certain you like uh, interface is being a bitch or does it on purpose because yes with a with a avid hardware is automatic but with non-avid audio it takes five minutes to do that I, I i made two videos about it it takes five minutes to do the ping yourself and you're done you're set you don't have to change it ever again all right all right all right um if forced to choose between EQ or saturator as only analog hardware unit to go within the box mixing, what would you be? A saturator. Um, let's see. Dag, what would you recommend getting a subwoofer if the monitors are small, six inches, but the studio is also small? That's a tricky question because I just solved this problem on a on a friend's studio the problem with sub in small spaces is that it's going to be a nightmare to place correctly to treat the room correctly and it might hurt you more than not having it with that said um with since inches if especially if you work on a lot of like trap hip-hop 808 or even modern rock with like all the down tuning and everything you might want to add a sub but it's mandatory it's mandatory that you know how to place it and you know how to measure a little bit because in my friend's studio we just were there like a few days ago i literally sat down and the moment i sat down i told them like dude you have an, a massive bass knoll here because of the sub so it was actually better without it but that's because he placed it where everybody plays it. You have the monitor here, he placed it underneath the desk, in the center, and that's it. And you got a massive null, he couldn't hear anything for like 120 to 50. Just nothing. So, yes, you can get a sub, just make sure you know how to place it and then you measure. It's mandatory. Otherwise, you're going to do more damage than, than, than anything. If you wanted to recreate a nice studio guitar signal for live show, how would you do it? I'm not sure. To be honest, I'm not sure I'm the right person to ask this to. You know, I'm I'm not I'm not a live engineer. I know my limits. I would just right now, if I was to answer to you, I would I would just you know wing it. <laughs> I prefer tell you, look, I'm not the right you know person to say that because I don't know enough about life. I would probably stereo i would i would probably use either use stereo effects or just the old fucking way just move the channel to another channel delay it a little bit and pan it but this is me not knowing about live shows <laughs> leo dashaman thank you for the donation much much appreciated man thank you guys uh, you're being am amazing I really appreciate it. It allows me to spend time with you in these live sessions here. And every every donation really helps. Thank you. Um, let's see what we have. Is it true that this mastering service from Lander is nothing else 
than Ozone 9? Yeah, basically, yes. What do you think it is? The online services is a bunch of presets. That's it. Um, how is the Gain Lab Emperor CQ noisy? No, it's not. It's not noisy at all. And it's amazing. I just use it like yes on this master that i'm doing this breakbeat jazz edm <laughs> combo that i'm doing uh it's uh it's fucking amazing the, the top end is like so exciting you know um i have a lot of really good top ends here between the api 5100 the mag the synth the pq and the empress is just something special for the top end the, the low end is a whole different ball game it changes way too often for song to song to say but um yeah czar thank you so much for the donation much much appreciated um what your question what is the ideal size monitor for a small room 250 centimeter square wait so that would be two meters and a half by two meters and a half that's hella small that is hella small. I would not go, given, given the fact that a lot of people have have huge monitors in small rooms, all right? Huge monitors in small rooms. But the room has to be a little bigger than that. It has to be a minimum size where you can adapt, a minimum size with which you just, it doesn't matter if it's, too small for the monitors it's still better to have bigger monitors but yours if it's two by two by 2.5 by 2.5 meters that's really small that's like less than my desk i wouldn't probably go above five inches you know five inches woofer for that and then use headphones in combination with it because you're in a pretty you know small bad situation room if it's that small thank you thank you for the donation again i hope this answered the question um when mixing mastering dance hip-hop music i always realize that my kick low end is too loud in the end but when i turn the kick down the comp on my two drum bus doesn't doesn't work the same solution yes First of all, turn your kick down before setting your two bus, your your drum bus compressor, and that will solve the problem. As for your uh, kick low end is too low in the end, it's probably because you know is um you have a in a room some 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 small room home studios either they have a dip in the monitoring in the listening position or they have a bump, especially. Uh, it happens often with ported front ported monitors right because they blow the bass in your face and it you know sometimes it's just, it depends how it reflects in the room it can it can be a, a dip or a bump if it's too low you probably have a bump so you tend to keep it lower and then you go out and your you know and your uh, low end is too is too little it's too thin or you high pass too much that's another thing that could happen but the solution is, again, set your your drum bus um, after you lower the kick. And if you happen to have this problem often, which you shouldn't, because if it's consistent, if you consistently find that when you think you're done with the kick, you go out and it's too little kick, then get the memo. You know, when you think you're done, up 2 dB, right? But if it's consistent, then you can simply use, you can use a multiband on drum bus and just adjust the threshold of, you know, your low end only. Um, that could be a viable option. Sean Wei, thank you so much for the donation. Much, much appreciated. Uh, and your question, do you calibrate your converters? If so, how often? I'm not sure what you mean by calibrating my converters. The converters come with the calibration, which is, um, written in the manual you know the levels they're calibrated to i don't calibrate them differently some converters they 
uh, give you the possibility to change that, right? Uh, I don't. Um, I mean, the AD Plus, for example, here, you have the calibration is right in front, right? So I have minus 14, minus 16, and minus 18, right? So let me turn it on and I'll show you. I mean, you, you're far, but so basically, this is my mastering converter, right? There's a, there's a calibration in D, DBFS, and it's here, and it's got three settings, minus 14, 16, and 18. I keep it at 14 simply because the lower it is, the less headroom, the, the lower the level, of course, the, the sooner you will go to zero, right? The reason because I keep it that way is because if I want to clip my converters for mastering purposes, this is how I clip them faster, as in with less signal going in. If I switch it from 14 to 18, I would have to crank my output on the Fusion a lot more to clip it because the, the converter has so much headroom, right? If I want to use the clipping circuit, I need to keep it lower so I don't run out of headroom on this end of the hardware before hitting the converter. But as for calibrating, the calibration is already in the converters. Um, I don't touch it. This one happens to have like the three stages on front, so I don't I don't really calibrate it. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I hope this answers the question. All right, all right. Um, how much different is the stereo information when you compare headphones to monitors? Are they comparable? The experience is totally different. Is it totally different? So totally different for like two reasons. The first reason is because of the proximity of the drivers in the headphones to your eardrums. The second, of course, because headphones are binaural, right? They're not stereo really. So if I'm looking at my speakers, my left ear is listening to this speaker, but my, my right ear is listening to that speaker as well. And same goes for the other speakers. So I have from one speaker, I have both the signal that hits both my ears and this one is delayed, right? And the same and the opposite on the other side. With headphones, you don't. The left ear, ear lot, the, life, the, right, the left side and the right ear hears the right side is completely isolated. Now, yes, you can use open, um, open back headphones, but ain't nowhere near the same. The second thing is, have you noticed how much the change, how much the sound changes when you even move your headphones on your head? You know, you don't you don't have a glue to your ears to your ears. So even when you work on headphones and you move them around and they slide back or slide move like, you know, it's not the same. And the stereo image is the first main difference between mixing on a pair of speakers and the headphones. And then the third reason, of course, is the the air moving when you know when you mix with headphones you don't have like your desk vibrating because of the low end you don't know you don't feel the vibration i i laughed my ass off today and i'll probably <laughs> i just don't want to don't, don't want to do like i don't want to give these people publicity there was an instagram video that popped up on my on my feed and this guy titled his stupid one minute video, how to make your mix louder in 15 seconds, which the t by, just by the title, you know, it's a crock of shit just right away, right? Right there. And this guy was like, s s push your track into limiting as much as you can until you start distorting and then grab your, <laughs> grab your EQ, watch it. Use the steepest filter you have and cut everything below 35 and below, like everything below, from 35 and below. And I'm like, you motherfucker. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is, and probably he probably he doesn't even like. He probably thinks it's is actually a good advice. Why? Because he probably mixes in a room where he can't even hear anything below 35, so it doesn't make any difference for him. Yeah, of course, if you've got, you know, 35 and below, it's going to be louder because you can push into your limiter. 
you're also gonna lose your balls on the on the on the on the way through your mix and she's just gonna drop them and <laughs> i was like how how can people listen to this shit so yeah i mean with headphones you can feel the vibration right and people say oh you can hear below 30 or below 25 you can't hear it but you can't feel it i sure as shit i do so <laughs> this is what happens when you don't have a pair of speakers right uh you mix in headphones or like small monitors and he's just oh let's cut you know below 35 and below because i can't hear anything yeah you can't hear anything <laughs> the rest of the world yeah you can uh hold on there's someone donating here it's no blind deep thank you so much man did you check your fusion uh with plugin doctor a bunch of them have stereo issues um no i didn't <clears throat> i didn't i didn't uh use him i didn't i didn't check it with stu with a uh, plugin doctor i want to i want to just simply say that if i if mine had a problem with stereo image I would hear it because I'm extremely sensitive to that. Um, I don't know if the stereo, What I never heard of anyone having the, the stereo issue. I only know of one video comparing the plugin to the hardware and the, the vintage drive didn't have any drive on the sides, which is not good. <laughs> but um, think about it. My chain is all calibrated to perfection. If my Fusion had even a slight tilt on one of the sides, I'm a Virgo. And aside the fact that I can hear 0 0.2 dB difference between things, 0 0.2 dB, even in level, even in just level, I would know just because my system is, you know, perfectly calibrated and, and even my input and outputs, even for mixing, not just for mastering, are to the sense of db so no i didn't check it but i can i can promise you my doesn't i don't know and you know i never heard of people having problems with the fusion with uh with um stereo image to be honest thank you again for the donation we have a member in the house ahmed musa welcome um I've realized the amount of low end in records is growing through the years. Yes, of course it did. I find myself not having the right reference for, for a nice modern pop rock song. What music do you suggest to hear? For, oh, well, it depends on, I don't remember titles, but usually, unless, uh, if the client gives you a reference, that's your reference. If it doesn't give you a reference, just go on chart because at the end of the day your reference are the popular songs and then add your taste to it like sometimes i get chart i get uh references i don't get references that often but it happened like lately i got a couple of drake references a couple of little peep references and uh i take the reference as a starting point and then of course every song is different but <clears throat> in most cases the low end I, it didn't wow me so I was like, all right, you know, this is your reference, but I can make the track better because it can, can have a, like a, lo, a little more like focus low end or a little less harshness at the top and still be bright. So I would just, you know, just look at the charts because at the end of the day, that's what people reference to. And for people, by people, I mean the listeners, right? They reference your mix and the artist mix with the other popular songs because they're popular for reason. people listen to them. But yeah, the, the the amount of low end they definitely grow through the years. Um, David, do you have a playlist in Spotify with your mixers or something? Yes, I do. Uh, I do. I th I think if you look for Mixbus TV, uh, it's there somewhere. I have a list, a, a playlist with my with my mixers on Spotify, which are not even probably not even like thirty percent of the mixes and masters that I do because I forget to add shit there. But there's definitely a playlist. I, you know what? I can try to. Uh, I'll, I'll post it somewhere, like on Instagram or somewhere like that. I have it. I also have a playlist here on YouTube of some of the, you know, mixes and masters that I did, which is another playlist. Again, it's probably like twenty percent, but still. Um, all right, all right. How does the eight? OC808 compared to a Neumann TLM 103. 
and how long was Peanut in your studio? Peanut is always in my studio. <laughs> um, there's no comparison for me with the TLM 103. The TLM 103 is not a bad mic by any chance, by any stretch of imagination, but uh, it's kind of a thin in the low end. Um, it's a little too brittle on some, you know, vo voices. Uh, the, o the OC 808 is just so, I don't know. I want to say like, first of all, the thing with the OC 808 is just, just so well balanced. I don't want to call it neutral because it is on the transparent side, but it's, it's just so, it, it, it just, I don't know. I don't know the word for it. It's really weird. Um, it became my favorite mic for a reason, the EOC. Um, the TLM is just, I don't know, it's just a little, it, the low end is a little skinny to me. Um, and it's brittle. It also has, the OC has more rejection. So if you're if you're recording in a in a room that is not like amazing and you have like some reflections, the OC is like better isolated to it. And with that, with that said, there's all the other thing about the OC 818. So the the Bluetooth control. And you can set the filters from your phone. You can set the polar pattern. You can have mixed and polar pattern between in between polar pattern. You know, it's and you can recall presets and save presets. It's just freaking amazing. And the capsule is like a ceramic capsule. It doesn't deteriorate, so it's it it, it doesn't. It doesn't change it with temperature. It's like it's just amazing. It's just an amazing mic. Uh, um. All right, let's see. Snow Dean Bleep, thank you so much for being so generous in this live stream. I really, really appreciate. All right, let's see what else what we have. Um. Uh, It's interesting. In aerospace engineering, we study the resonance frequency of the human body, uh, and they are in the range of 20, 40 hertz. That's why these frequencies can be so important. There you go. You have an aerospace engineer telling you if you don't fucking believe me. <laughs> How hard do you drive your pre-master bus? I don't even know what a pre-master bus is. You mean the mix bus? Like my two bus? Um, how uh hot? Um, I don't know. It's usually the first amber light on the two, um, 542s. I calibrated once and I never, and I never like change it or whatever. I can probably swing between 2 dB up and down if I want the mix to sound like more or less one way or the other. What do you think about analog summing? Have you? ever watched my channel before <laughs> have you ever heard of the Neve orbit does it a big job if you're mix in the box i made a very popular slash unpopular video about some mixers back then when i made the video some mixers wears nothing but uh, transformers or a couple of transformers you know hooked up to a bunch of channels um, and they were marketing the Sami mixers as the solution to a problem that didn't exist and it doesn't exist, which is, oh, the digital sum is bad and is your bottleneck. It's bullshit. The digital sum is perfectly fine, is actually perfect if you gain stage your shit correctly. And there's no problem with the digital sum. Um, that's maybe why some people don't like it, because it's too perfect. But saying, buy this because you have a problem in your digital sum, that's crap. That's absolute crap. So when I made that video, I said, if I, want, if I, if I had to pay $4,000 for a box with a couple of transformers in it, that makes no sense to me. It makes no sense. Because I can have a couple of transformers in in a, in a you know in a compressor in an EQ or tubes that do color, and 
they also do something else as opposed to just being a color box with no controls other than pan and gain, right? Right now, the new generation, I probably want to say even because of my video, <laughs> of some mixers has have more functions, right? They had maybe a lift, maybe a parallel something, maybe, you know, whatever that is. That is a friend of mine has a dangerous something that has like several functions, very much like a unit like Fusion. And if you have all in the box that can be a viable solution, as long as it's not a dumb box with a couple of transformers in it and nothing else, it's just pain and gain, pain and gain, because you're not doing anything by splitting your signal into 16 channels at your output and then resumming it there. You're not doing anything. What does is the color of the transformers. So with that in mind, if you have a bunch, like before getting a summing box, maybe think about getting like a couple of colored units. You know, they can also do something else. That's my thought. But I don't know the orbit. I know of it. And um, I, I never tried it, to be honest. Um, have you got hardware which you use on every mix? Uh, yeah, most of my hardware I use on every mix. I have, like, let's say I have, I, I counted like a few days ago, I have about 60 channels of analog gear that including like a fat cell that has one and two channels. So about 45 units, I think. Um, probably 30 are always on 50%, I think, 60. But yeah, for the most part, like most of my gear, I always have it on mix. All right, all right, all right. I'm gonna stay for, let's say another 30 minutes. All right, so if you guys want your question answered quickly, just use the super chat. Now, what do you think of the Neumann KH three tens? Would I benefit from a sub in a three by three per by three point three by four meter high ceiling room? Um, I'm not sure. I the the Neumann K three tens are the three ways. Let me check that out really quick. We're not sure. Yeah, those are. Um, I don't think you should. This is the thing. I tried the, the Neumann, the small one. And I very, very much disliked them. Their top end was like super harsh and I just didn't click with it. And there, were, there was no low end at all. I assume the three ways had a little bit of more low end, but I probably, if that's the trend, maybe they are a little unbalanced, as in the low end is a little, the, the, the low end is a little underpowered for the top end, because the top end of those monitors that I tried, which again, they were the two ways, so this might be completely different. There was like way too out of whack. Uh, could you, maybe, the small is a little, the, the room's a little small, and like I said, if you get a sub, you need to make sure you position it well and you measure, otherwise you could do more damage than good. But unfortunately, I don't have direct experience with the three ways. I know the two ways, I don't like them. I don't know the three ways. Sorry. All right. Mm. Do you use the vintage drive section on the SS of Fusion when mastering? I feel... I always feel it adds a little too much dirt. Yeah, 50% of the time, even the lowest setting is is too much. 50% uh, of the time, and it just it adds a little a little nice tone and color to it. So it's just split 50-50. I don't really like. I have so many units that have colors or saturation stages that I'm not worried if that doesn't work. I have I don't know. Even just the Empress EQ has the two boost. I had that, or the Rhea has just, just gained staging in, in and out, it will just add another color, or the Transformers on the NG or the THD. It, you know, the Fusion is just another tool. Sometimes it, it does work very well, sometimes it doesn't, you know. Especially if you have a mix that has a lot of, like, energy in the low-mid frequency, it tends to muddy the waters a little bit there. 
what is the price range? What is the price the range of audio interface which you could say that buying and using outboard gear too makes sense? I would say anything of the new AVB Moto series. My uh, is an extended AVB system. Anything of the new Moto AVB series, you're good to go. They have amazing converters. All right, is it? Is it better to record my guitar amp as loud as possible without clipping or record it at lower dB and turn up gain? Um, generally speaking, I'm not a fan of recording as high as possible without clipping. Because even unless you have a good interface with good converters, the higher you go and they just kind of lie about the specs. They kind of introduce a little bit of distortion, even if you're not clipping, like physically, right? Past the zero. So it's always a safe bet to stay lower because especially the AD stage, that's why, you know, the, AD, the mastering AD are so expensive. It's a lot harder and expensive to build than the DA stages. And when you record, you use the AD. So with that said, I'm not a fan of being like, up the asshole of the red. Um, in your case with, with guitars, you have to keep in mind one problem, which is noise and signal to noise ratio. So if you have a little bit of noise when you in your signal, like coming out of the amp because of the amp, because of everything, you wanna be recording a little higher because at that point you maximize the signal to noise ratio. But I wouldn't worry that much unless you have a really fucking noisy rig and a noisy signal chain like your mic and your cable and your preamp more than the amp itself. I wouldn't worry about. I would rather stay a little, you know, lower and just deal with the with the level later on because you you're not recording on tape. You don't need to maximize like. It's not that important to maximize, and actually in digital could be counterproductive. So I would stay conservative. All right, all right. How are you managing your analog boxes in the chain? Like the Tegeler connector, you have you compared the NG bus with dangerous compressor and swift compressor? I managed my routing with the flock uh, patch bay. I, I just got the 32 channels. So it's like heaven. I don't have to manage anything. I just literally drag and drop, you know, chains and custom chains with all my gear any, anywhere I want without cables, without conversion, without nothing. The flock patch bay is amazing. Should I buy the Golden Age LA 2A or 3A? It depends. What do you want? What do you want a LA 2A style compressor or a LA 3A style compressor? The the LA 2A is the Golden Age makes like they sound like that. They they sound like you know the original pretty much. And actually the 3A has a bunch of like gain functions that are really fun. They both are the same at the same level. Um, the 3A is more maybe for like male vocal rock and guitars and stuff like that and uh the LA2A more for like a female ballad or a warm vocal but they're they're both amazing depends what style of compression you want it's not one is better than the other or what they do they're they're right there um Lavery gold plugin emulation how can you emulate a converter? <laughs> you mean probably the soft clipping circuit of the Lavery? First of all, the Dangerous is better. Just a little bit. They're like head to head, of course. I find the Dangerous a little better for clipping. But you can emulate an analog clipping stage with a, like, especially the Lavery with a, with a plug-in other than using a clipper. That's it. There's not, there's not much to it. And every clipper is different. And every song will react different to, to the material. Don't think that having the Dangerous or the Lavery, you clip it 
And if your masters were uh, minus 10 or minus 9 LUFS before, you buy one of those and immediately you go to minus 5. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> the best case scenario, you can you know shave off 3 dB off more than you would have nominally. Um, what do you think about the plugins by analog session for mastering? I never really tried them. I have a mode at 38 hertz in my room. What can I do about it? You can try to move your monitors and you can try to build or buy a tuned bass trap. That's the only thing. If it's so specific, that's the only thing you can do. Try to move monitors around, see if it if it gets better and at that point if it's that specific you need a tuned tra bass trap it is all it is, is about the expensive mic or it's all about the mixing and mastering it's about both it's about both but if you have a bad recording especially for vocals it's gonna be kind of hard to to have a good final product the mix can fix a lot of problems, can enhance a lot of things, can make things prettier, but it also depends on the genre. If you have a vocals that is drowned in reverb and delay, it's, you can get away with like worse recording. It would be still better if you did a proper recording with a good mic. But if you have like a rap hip hop vocal and where the vocals are a ballad or, you know, a modern pop song where the vocals are up in front and so exposed, you need a good mic and a good preamp because mixing is going to do only so much to fix. Then when you have the good recording, you also need a good mix and mastering, you know, to, comp to compete with the big guys. So both. Um, do you use Sausage Fan or no? I don't. <laughs> I don't. But it's, it's, it's a funny plugin. And I, it's a it's a wave shaper slash clipper, by the way. There's there are many out there. I have so many I don't need any more. Um all right, all right. There's one thing I've never understood. If I record at 48 hertz K 24 bit and I mix at 40 48 K with sample rate should be the master. If it's different, I will do music for it. No, okay, okay. So if you record at 48, 24 bit, you mix at 28, uh, 48, 24 bit, right? If you master, pay attention. If you master in the box, it makes no freaking difference. You could technically upgrade, uh, up sample, so to speak, from 48 to 96, right? Because technically your computer allows you to do that. But it doesn't do anything to the file. I have a video on upsampling. It's not possible. You can't upsample. You can't. If you record it at 44, it will stay at 44. If you record it at 48, it will stay at 48. All right? The reason because we mix at least at 48 if something is recorded at 44 is because the plugins work better at 48. And, you know but the file itself will not have a better quality it will be 44.1 with a bunch of nothing added to it and it will the session will work at 48 and the plugins will work at 48. now if you already worked at 48 recorded and mixed the mastering if you are in the box can be a 48. you have no reason to up sample so to speak um if you're not in the box and this is what we do if I receive a mix that is a 48, I run the session at 88 or 96. This has nothing to do with the video. Just because when you go out of the box and you go into the hardware, when you capture the signal from the hardware with that converter, with the mastering converter, you want to capture at a higher level, at a higher sample rate, sorry, so that you capture, so that you first of all, minimize the ADDA trip, which is not a problem, but you capture all the nuances and all the information, the transit and everything else that you have on the hardware. You just capture a new track at that point at the highest possible sample rate. 
So that in that case it makes sense to master at a higher level, a higher sample rate. But if you master in the box, you got no reason to fake up sample. It, it does nothing to you. It just makes the file bigger. That's it. All right. Um, we're almost at the end, guys, of this impromptu live stream. Do you add 32 hertz or 60 hertz to the kick? Why these two random frequencies? Are you watching like IG <laughs> charts? You add whatever frequency you need to add. It changes every time. It doesn't. It's why 32 or 60? Could be none of them or could be both. Um, what's your favorite piece of gear you bought 15 years ago which you still use distressor there <laughs> if you have a modern near you speaker what, what I lost it if you have a modern a modem near your speakers covered in copper foil don't use it don't use Wi-Fi in your studio anyway What's up, David? Do you use Softube Console 1? Yeah, it's right here next to me. More than your Waves uh, SSL channel strip nowadays. Yes, yes, definitely. Yes, and not only, but Console 1 kind of cut a lot of plugins, a lot of plugin use in general, because I absolutely love everything basically that software made and it's so efficient to have everything there and i open a channel strip and i had i can have the ssl channel but the api eq or the chandler eq or you know whatever it's it's amazing i did a video on uh, i had like something like 40 units 40 40 hardware units on a mix the video is on the channel and i show how what i used but if you if you watch the plugin uh in the in the mixer page you can see it in the video there's so little plugins and you know there's a console one on every channel so i definitely it changed my workflow a lot and uh for the better i love i love console one all right we have jason martinez thank you so much for the donation really appreciate it um and your question i greatly appreciate your advice on recording guitar I heard it's better to record bass guitar direct than from an app. What do you think? I think you should record both. Um, that's it. <laughs> I think that you do need a DA, a DA. You want a DA signal when you record with amp. If you can't, don't have an amp. You can't record a bass with a with a with an amp. It's not a big deal. There's amazing plugins that you know do. Um, Base simulation, base amp simulation. Like I love Amplitude, uh, Parallax. It's great too from uh, Neural DSP. I think if you can, you should have both, and um, it's definitely not better to record like with a DA instead of an amp. What what an amp gives you, the DA won't ever give you. I mean, you can get fairly close with a with an amp scene in the mix later on, but it's not better. Um, we can argue if it's worth it, you know, <clears throat> because it goes a lot goes into recording an amp for bass, microphones, preamps, amp head, blah 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 blah, and everything, isolation and all that. And in a mix, especially with the plugins nowadays for bass amp, they're really like really good. Uh, I think better than for guitars. So it's if it's you feel like it's worth going through the whole process of recording bass. But some artists do have their sound and their sound, it's part of their sound is their amp. Think of Fieldy from Korn, right? He's got his Twitter and he clicks on the bass. You need to record his rig to have get the sound. For a generic recording when you know you don't need a you don't have a specific rig which has had a cabinet and maybe some pedals that the artist uses, you can avoid if you want to use to to, to record a, an amp. But um, if you can't, just record both always. I hope this answers the question. And thank you, Jason, for the donation. Much appreciated. All right, all right, all right.
Have you ever DJ live before? No. Uh, actually, yes, I did DJ. I was I was DJing at the time with the band. Uh, I did few few live few uh, DJ sets. Uh, Dan broke. Thank you for the donation. Uh, much appreciated again. Thank you guys. What to buy? NG bus versus dangerous compressor. This, I don't know. The shift is the thermionic culture, right? Um, I can tell you between the NG and the dangerous, I, I think there's no contest. The NG wins all the time, every time, every day. The dangerous is a fairly, you know, transparent compression is a bit flat to me and it is not exciting that much. Uh, to the point that a good digital plugin will probably do the same. Uh, the NG is a whole different beast. You know, you have transformers, you have THD, you have digital recall. Like it's not even a, it's not even a competition for me. The Swift, if it's the Thermionic culture, I don't have direct experience with it. It doesn't seem to be that popular. I don't see many people using it. Using it. Um, so yeah, I hope this answered the question. NB all day, NG all day. What do you think about the Worm Audio WAA2? I think, aside from a um, few exceptions, you shouldn't buy gear that is middle of the road because you're gonna resell it for something better later and in the mid time, in the, in the process, you're gonna lose money. And I don't have direct experience with that one. I heard the 76, which it doesn't cut it for me, so I'm not sure about that one. Uh, I would probably guess it's in the same ballpark. I wouldn't. I wouldn't bother. I would bother. Like there are actually like the Golden Age Two uh, A is amazing. I have it for a reason. Um, Stam Audio makes an amazing Two A, better than probably UA. You know, and I would go with something like that instead of like the cheap version. Don't cheap out. If you have to cheap out, just don't. Don't cheap out on here. You know. Gilbert, I, I I answered a question about the the summit mixer before, and I do have a video on it. I, I don't I don't think summit boxes are a good you know investment, but you know in this video in this live stream I responded a question similar like that earlier. Um, all right, all right, all right. Any piece of gear would you like to add to your studio soon? <clears throat> Young hustler, man, how are you doing? Yes, there are. Um, and actually, I am adding it. I am waiting for it. Um, there's two units that are coming. <clears throat> One is a giant monster six unit, but I, I can't say it because right now it's NBA. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, it was supposed to be here in November. We are late. They're building it, and it is it will it will come. Uh, it's a monstrous unit, and it's like I said, six unit high is gonna go on this rack, and you will see it soon. And another one is again I. Well, this I guess I can say it's probably gonna be something from Loop Trotter. We'll see. Uh, but I'm pretty happy with my rig right now, especially with the added flock. I just. You know, I, I'm extremely happy, and I was saying it earlier, uh, there's a point in which too much gear becomes a distraction instead of helping you. So I'm thinking I'm at that level, you know, when this side rack is going to be filled with the things that I'm waiting for, that's probably going to be, you know, it. Maybe, you know, in time there will, there will be a switch, but, you know, I have a lot. <laughs> all right, all right. Amazing converter or amazing speakers? Um, let's put it this way. Your DA, which is the converters, your speakers are attached. Even um, uh, a good interface nowadays has a great DA. Compared to 10 years ago, amazing. Compared to 20 years ago, absolutely mind-blowing for cheap. Your speakers, whole different ballgame. You need money for good speakers. And... With that said, you already have good enough converters for monitoring, so you should get speakers and focus on getting the best speakers possible you, that you can possibly can at the moment. All right, last two questions. Uh, overstayer. I 
had one unit, I think, or two, no, one, two units. One was the one that um, Softube just did. I actually kind of like the this plugin better just because it's so versatile compared to the Overstayer that one unit. I don't remember how, uh, how it's called, which was a little bit limited. Uh, they are they are good. They didn't blow my mind. And yeah, that's pretty much it. I know. I want to say I I always I I also had for a few days the gray one, which was the field something some compressor, kind of fat compressor that was kind of cool. Uh, still, <clears throat> the kind of saturation at least at that time I didn't I didn't work on it too much but enough and the saturation on it it just it didn't wow me for that time which was years and years ago so yeah i mean that's all i can really say on the overstayer and um yeah i mean thank you guys for staying here with me these two hours and Thank you for all the donation and those are much appreciated and uh, and it's about time to go. I'll take the last two. What's your favorite better maker device? Do you see any better make better maker device in my rig? I'm not a fan of them. None of them, to be honest. That uh, everything they make, there's some somebody else makes something that is better. Um, all right. Why I was told my mix sounded too clean because it sounded too clean. <laughs> Probably you need more saturation or you need analog. When people say nobody needs analog, but that's probably, you know, not not true. And it sounds like you did. Anyway, guys, thank you so much. Um, I will cut and paste this um, this live live stream and put it on the channel. Thank you everybody for joining and thank you everybody for the donation. Be safe. See you next time.